Welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos a todos. Really just want to thank everyone for being with us today. My name is Felicia Perez, and I am helping to produce this webinar. Thank you all again for being here. Before I hand things over to our amazing panelists and moderator, I just want to make sure that we're all going to be able to access the information that is being shared. So before we get started, if everyone could look at the bottom of your Zoom platform menu, you'll see a mute button, a video, chat, Q&A icon, and then you'll see a little icon that looks like a globe or the world and it says interpretation. If you could click on that and pick the language that you would like to hear today's information, either in English or Spanish. So if everyone could just take a moment right now and I'm going to make sure that the interpretation is on. So one second. Hola, buenas tardes. Gracias por estar aquí con nosotros. Me llamo Felicia Pérez y soy la productora de este webinario esta tarde. Gracias nuevamente por su presencia. Gracias a los panelistas y a nuestro moderador. Quisiera comentarles cómo acceder a la información. Eh, en un momento vamos a activar los canales de interpretación. Y en la parte inferior de su pantalla, donde ven ustedes el botón de silenciar el micrófono, de prender el video, del chat y del que dice Q y A, que es para preguntas y respuestas, en un momento verán un globo terráqueo. Para los que necesitan interpretación, quiero que hagan clic en el globo terráqueo y luego ahí seleccionen el idioma de su preferencia, inglés o español. Ok. So now I'm going to turn on the interpretation information. And we have that going now, I believe. Can I get a thumbs up from anyone? Molly, do you mind giving me a thumbs up? Oh, I see many thumbs up. Okay, great. Thank you all. So as we are in these different spaces to hear either in Spanish or in English, please note that if it's of interest to you, you can go ahead and go into a different uh, language channel if you're interested in also hearing what the information is like in either English or Spanish. So know that you can leave one channel and go to a different language channel throughout our time together, however you please. And then also final, before I move things on and pass off the rest of our time to Dr. Struble as our moderator, just note that each of the slides um, probably like 99% are both in English and Spanish in terms of their content. So you might see things in italics or in a green color, and that will be in Spanish. And then things that are not in that will be in English. So thank you all again. If you have any questions, please put things in the chat in terms of technical questions. If you have questions about the content and information that's being shared, please put that in the Q&A feature if you'd like, or write it down, note it, and hold on to it because we are going to have a Q&A section uh, at the end of our time. So I'm going to pass things on to Dr. Struble, who is our moderator for our time, and turn off my camera and come back a little bit later. Thank you all so much again, Dr. Struble. The floor, so to speak, is Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Beautiful people. We are so fortunate to have you all here with us tonight um, in, or this afternoon for those of you who are in on the West Coast. Uh, this is a excellent opportunity to learn more about what's going on in the environmental justice movement. We hope to kind of unpack a lot of these concepts and tell you about our urgent issue that's developing right now. And we hope to call your attention to it. And we have some calls for action as well. So before we go any further, I am Dr. Bruce Strobel. I'm the executive director at Citizens for a Sustainable Future based in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, I serve in various uh, capacities in, in our community here in Tallahassee and at the national level. I work with the Moving Forward Network as an advisory member, just advising and working to advance environmental justice and transforming the freight system in the United States. So next slide, please. So just a glance at our program for the evening, 
uh, you'll get introduced to our various panelists. We have an excellent panel tonight. They're going to be breaking down their their vantage points on the different aspects of the environmental justice issues that we're facing in the country. And we're also going to go to our call to action. And then we're going to have an in-depth question and answer session towards the end. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat now as they come up. And at the end, we'll be sure to get to as many questions as we have time for. All right. Also, just a reminder to my speakers, we're going to try to slow it down just to make sure that our translators have an opportunity to capture what we're actually saying. Okay, so ultimately what we're here for today, we're going to be talking about some urgent issues as it relates to the environment and its impact on communities. And we're talking about communities of color. Uh, there right now is a, the EPA is getting ready to present some regulations and we have some suggestions and we would like to get the community behind them and supporting them as we talk about how we need to regulate freight pollution. Um, and this is really about protecting communities from various health risks. And we need to make sure that everyone understands the consequences of any failure to take action on these issues. Um, when we talk about the various aspects and freight pollution, we're looking at massive loss of life. Uh, increased medical burdens for people of color across the country, for disabled individuals, um, for people who have any kind of financial burdens or challenges, they're the ones who are bearing the brunt of our environmental pollution. The technology to combat this pollution already exists, as you'll see presented to you tonight as well. And the purpose of our meet, being here tonight is really to display the need for immediate action from the Environmental Protection Agency. And we also want to highlight the feasibility of many of the solutions that already exist that we hope to see put into action. We call these zero emission solutions. And then again, at the end, we'll come back to our call to action with some simple steps you could take to get active and get involved in this movement to make sure that we get the regulations in place that are necessary. Next slide, please. So I really want to start off just by setting the context. What we're discussing tonight is environmental racism and the various solutions that we've come up with to address them. Um, so, th and this is part of the, the larger environmental justice movement. But before we go further, environmental racism is a form of systemic racism where communities of color are disproportionately burdened with health hazards. And this happens as a result of poorly planned policies or sometimes intentional policies and practices that force people to live in proximity to sources of toxic waste. So if you all were just to take a quick second, you would be able to think of some kind of environmental issue that is impacting your community. Uh, these are widespread, they're not to one location. But what we do find is that in communities of color, whether that's our Black, our Latinx, our Indigenous communities, our Asian Pacific Islanders, and we see this all across the globe, we find that people in those communities are facing higher burdens than people in other communities. So if you look at this graph here, you'll see pollution exposure by population. And you can see Latinx Americans exposed to 63% more pollution than they actually produce. African Americans, 56% 56 more, 56 more pollution than they produce, where white Americans are exposed to 17% less pollution than they produce. And that is an example of, of white or pollution privilege. And so when we think about how we got into this situation, it really goes all the way back to the formation of this country, some of the, the industrial revolution and some of the outgrowths of it in the early phases of American racism, whether that was redlining, which was a practice where they would design neighborhoods and deem some of them as redlined or not feasible for uh, investment. So they divested from those neighborhoods. And at the same time that that was happening, you have polluting industries moving into those neighbor, those areas. And guess who lived there? Black and Latino is Latinx Americans. We also saw similar practices near indigenous communities and for Asian Pacific Islanders as well, and other people who were uh, not as uh, privileged and struggling in the United States. And we saw this practice taking place all, ac all across the world. Um, so on a national scale, disparities in exposure to particulate matter and nitrogen oxide are much larger when considering red line areas or the HOLC grades. 
um, than when we're looking at just simply race or ethnicity alone. And the findings highlight redlining as a racially discriminatory policy, 80 years old, but it still continues to influence the system uh, of environmental exposure and disparities here in the United States. Next slide, please. So a little more background on how we got into this situation with so much environmental pollution and why it impacts certain communities. I'm sure many of you, if you've taken a history class or if you've been able to watch certain movies lately, you may be familiar with the story of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the so-called Black Wall Street was located. And there was a huge race riot that took place there in the 1920s, destroying the Black Greenwood District. The reason I bring this up is because something interesting happened after this race riot. The people in the community were able to rebuild and start to bring their community back to what it once was before white terrorists went in and destroyed it. Well, that community was eventually finally destroyed by highways in the 1970s. There was an ongoing practice from the 1950s well into the 1980s and still continuing into this day where the United States governments and state governments across this country placed highways right through communities of color, whether those were Latinx, indigenous or black communities, and they were devastating. Over 1 million Americans, most of them low income people of color were displaced in this process. Businesses were destroyed and much um, pollution was introduced into these communities. We saw this in Montgomery, Alabama. We saw this in uh, the Overtown neighborhood in Miami, Florida. We saw this in Nashville, Tennessee, where Interstate 40 took a swerve going around a white community and going right through a black community in North Nashville. We saw this in Detroit with I-75 and I-375, the West End area of Cincinnati, home to 25,000 black residents in the 1950s, all forced to relocate to bring the I-75 through that area. Independence Heights in Texas, in Houston, in New Orleans, in Kansas City, we saw the same thing in the Treme community in New Orleans, one of the oldest black communities in the country, devastated by the establishment of the I-10. We saw the same thing in Kansas City as well. Uh, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Baltimore, we saw some able to mobilize there and block freeway constructions, but for many, this wasn't the case. Same thing in Southern California as well. Black and Latino neighborhoods, Interstates 5, 10, and the 110, specifically targeting communities of color. All right, next slide, please. So that brings me to my my last point, then I'm going to get to our next presenter. Um, the Moving Forward Network has come into um, place. It's an organization of more than 50 member organizations, and we focus on grassroots, frontline community knowledge and engagement, looking to address the negative impacts of the global freight transportation system. We have a very diverse membership, includes community leaders, academics, labor unions, and big environmental organizations. And we all work together to facilitate geographically dispersed integrated advocacy. And that's our strategic approach. We utilize organizing, communication, research, legal and technical assistance, all provided to frontline communities through organizations to really address the transportation issues and the pollution that comes along with it. We emphasize leadership development and movement building, and we respect multiple forms of expertise with the idea that we could build collective power. So through, through building power, doing advocacy, hosting peer-to-peer -peer trainings and workshops like we're here for tonight, we plan to bring people together to address issues with the freight transportation system and the pollution that comes with it. So with that said, uh, we're going to talk about what's going on uh, right now with the EPA and with the greenhouse gas, the phase three greenhouse, greenhouse gas rule. And I'm going to first introduce my first panelist. Next slide, please. Okay, you'll be hearing from Martinez Mina, uh, is a first generation Mexican American born and raised in Kansas City has a master's in nursing leadership. Her extensive environmental health training is an accumulation from her involvement in the environmental health program at Child Mercy, participation in the first cohort of the Alliance of Nurses for a Healthy Environment and the Environmental Justice Leadership Program at UC Davis, as well as her advocacy with Clean Air Now. She currently serves as the executive director of Clean Air Now and focuses her work on and passion to bring health equity and environmental justice for all. So attendance, I'm gonna turn it over to you. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm with Clean Air Now, which is an environmental justice organization born and raised by active and concerned community members wanting to better understand how the environment uh, they and their children grow up in is impacting their health. This same community is considered as being in the top 10 percentile for having the worst asthma rates, lead paint exposure, and low life expectancy. This is also a BIPOC community, many of which uh, English is their second language and they're low income and hardworking. Next slide. I'm going to jump straight into some of the technical information that our community leaders learn in our workshops, and that is the particles in air pollution and the risk from daily and nightly exposures, which happens when you lift fence line to polluters like highways, railways, industries, coal plants, you name it, there's so many, right? Air pollution that comes from diesel, for example, is made up of but a bunch of different chemicals that are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and black carbon, which all of which can perpetuate climate change as we're seeing some of those effects already in our neighborhoods. They pollute our air and uh, negatively impact our health. And what's interesting is that heavy duty vehicles make up just 5% of the vehicles now on the road, yet they generate more than 25% of the total global warming emissions from the transportation sector. They can create smog. You'll get those alerts on your Weather Channel app if you have one about poor air quality. And you may even notice soot buildup, which could be coming in different colors. Our community members noticed a yellow, a uh, thick soup buildup that would um, show up on their windows, on top of their cars and in their porches. Now there's different sizes for these pollutants or what they call particles. And size does matter. The smaller the size, the more damaging it is for us because then they can make it past our airway, our mucus defenses, our lungs and into our bloodstream. Next slide. The World Health Organization claims that air pollution is the cause for 7 million premature deaths. Healthcare is, as we know, very expensive. It doesn't seem to be a right for everyone. It doesn't look the same for everyone. And when you or your child is not feeling well, it impacts your school, career, income, quality of life, and honestly, everything. Common things we hear Uh, one second, everyone. We seem to have lost our presenter. Oh, We're give her a, yeah. Give her a second to rejoin. And um, yeah, it's one second. Or should we, uh, we could continue on and then let her finish when she comes back in. Let's see if she comes back. Okay. Uh, let's just, if y'all are okay, let's, let's, yeah, let's give, wait a, a nice... give her a couple minutes to re re-enter. I've been booted from a, a Zoom before. But yeah, I, I think, yeah, this is just really riveting. And I'm, I'm thinking um, where she's going with this is really important to what we're all here for tonight, just to talk about this phase three greenhouse gas rule that we're hoping that the Environmental Protection Agency moves forward with. And it, it's going to help protect us from situations like this, because we have a lot of heavy duty trucks on these highways, as I was explaining, they're all through our communities. Um, and if you live next to a highway, you live next to a poor community, you are overexposed to this toxic pollution. And we are in desperate need of regulation. And we're up against a really strong industry. And they are not backing down. So we can't back down either. And that's really why we called everyone here tonight in hopes that they could um yeah, in hopes I, that they can Tennis, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Okay. Apologies. I guess this is the time that my internet wants to cut loose, but I'll keep off my camera and maybe that'll also help for some reason. Uh, but thank you for, for covering and I'm not sure where I dropped off, but... Uh, uh, right here on, you were still on the effects of air pollution. So you could okay, just pick up. Perfect, perfect. 
so it's just very alarming, you know, like we, we develop allergies, but is it really because of what's going on in the change of season or is it because our bodies are reacting to the pollution and the contamination around us? More alarming is that air pollution can increase the risk of chronic health problems such as respiratory and cardiovascular disease, cancer, or shirt and life expectancy. Like the community that we serve in Armourdale, they have a 22 year life expectancy difference. That's honestly a lifetime. Imagine what you could do, uh, the amount of things that you could make difference for your community, for your family, and, uh, and so forth. So we have also to consider is the vulnerable populations such as children, elderly, and even pregnant women who run even more risk for some of these very dangerous health complications. And um, I wanted to bring in a study, a 2022 study, so a very recent uh, that involved Children's Mercy, uh, UMKC and UCS found that asthma disproportionately affects the health of BIPOC um, Kansas City pediatric patients, so children, and found that historical red lightning and racism correlates with asthma morbidity in the metro area, especially for children living closer to highways, rail yards, and toxic release inventory sites. Studies like this are helpful to validate what we already know. It's interesting that there's we need another study to help prove what the lived experience is. But those studies can be very um, helpful and essential, especially when we want to engage in uh, civic participation and regulations and so forth. But do not forget that human experience and the human expertise are just as important, if not more, than those studies. Next slide. Now, I just wanted to provide a little bit of information of the work that Cleaner Now does. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we've been around for several years and we like to be active in the community because the community is what started and initiated this, this fire and this drive to make a difference. And how do we do that? We're involved with community events. We engage community. We want to build that trust. We want to be seen. And our community members, our staff, our people in the front lines, they are from the same communities that we serve. They speak the same language that our community speaks. Another important uh, point that we do is the leadership uh, training that we provide for community members. So we have different workshops to dive more into a little bit on what I touched on about air pollution, climate change, the impacts of those local pollutants and how that how we are seeing health problems arise in our community, as well as what are the solutions? What does the community want to see different and oftentimes I leave those sessions learning more from them than the other way around. And uh, another point is citizen science. So we like to collect our own data. It's so important that community members own their data, are able to access it whenever they want instead of being blocked because they have to subscribe to something or be part of some kind of academic institution. We need to remove those barriers and make data accessible and owned by the community members. So you can see here we've done mapping activities to be able to identify um, assets, but also like the, the biggest concerns and pollution. And thank you, I will definitely slow down. Thank you. Uh, and also, we'll, we've done truck counting. So for example, our, we've had community members go on uh, a intersection that they use often. It's a residential area. And they were able to count up to 415 trucks for an average of 3.46 trucks a minute. That is going through the same neighborhood that they have their children having to cross the street to go to schools. This is why it's important to involve community and because they know where to look, they know what is needed and what the solutions will be. Uh, we oftentimes also meet and engage with vecinos, which are our neighbors, and they help drive the, st the strategies that Clean Air Now wants to take, the policies that we want to engage in, and those town halls that we want to be able to attend. And oftentimes, anytime there's engagement with 
government officials, with the health department, anyone in positions of power, we also advocate for it to be uh, considerate of the, the language difference, to be considerate of the time that they're having it because people work full time, right? So can it be in the evening time? Can it be weekends? And that's how we can kind of build up that advocacy so we can be present in the decision making spaces. And next slide. I just wanted to end with awesome shots of our great team and our great community. And also you're welcome to check out this resource that we just developed um, uh, December of last year called Vecinos KC Leads. It stands for Learn, Empower, Advocate, Dream, and Share. Honestly, I the only reason I've been able to get to the place I'm at is because of the resources, mentorship, and tools that have been shared with me by other amazing environmental justice leaders. And so if this is something that could be helpful for your neighborhood, uh, basically we wanted to develop an action plan where it provides a little bit more specific information to our neighborhood, as well as action items on what can be done and resources, glossary, information that community can access and use um, for any time that they're going to be involved in civic engagement or even to educate their healthcare providers or, um, or even the government and other officials. I'll end there. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Couldn't get off mute. Thank you so much, Attendance. That was excellent. And I'm going to go straight into our next two panelists. We have two brilliant individuals who are really going to break down what's at stake and what we're really asking for. Um, and first, we're going to have Jose Cordova. Jose Acosta Cordova is the Senior Transportation Policy Analyst at the Little Villages Environmental Justice Organization, and he leads their transportation and freight policy advocacy work at the city and state levels. He is also a third-year PhD student in geography and GIS at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. Um, Jose, thank you for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce the third person as well, our third panelist, Dave Cook who is a senior vehicles analyst in the clean transportation program, especially in both light and heavy duty fuel economy. Dr. Cook received his PhD in condensed matter physics in 2010 from the University of California, Berkeley, where his dissertation focused on the fundamental science behind modern hard drive technology, exploring the electronic and magnetic properties of these novel material systems, through, I can't even pronounce this for a micro calimetry. <laughs> You're going to have to explain that to us, Dr. Cook. Prior to this, he received his BS in physics from Harvey Mudd College in 2002 and his master's in science and physics from the University of California, San Diego. So I'm going to bring up both panelists and they're going to kind of co-present. I'm going to ask that you both remember to slow down a little for our translators. Jose. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stubel. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here with us this evening, afternoon, whatever part of the country you're coming from, um, or part of the world, hopefully. Um, so I'm going to first talk to you about, about the the uh, the GHG rule, um, the phase three GHG rule, uh, what it does. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, the MFN demands uh, and why we feel that this rule falls short. Um, so, uh, so basically, yeah. So this is dra this draft rule came out in April twenty twenty three. Um, it's proposing uh for heavy duty vehicles that a part of the and it's a part of the commitment that President Biden made in his ex executive order uh, to address pollution from heavy duty vehicles uh, while also promoting zero emissions. Um, the rule will revise the the GHG the current GHG emission limits for heavy duty trucks, <clears throat> and it is the most stringent option in the proposal. Uh, for the, well, which targets 25 to 50 percent zero emission transition by 2032, which also depends on the truck class. Um, and it says that the EPA should require 100 percent zero emission target by 2035 in the final rule uh, versus final rule versus view. Um, go to the next slide, please. Uh, it also uh, this acknowledgement from EPA throughout its proposal, how its assumptions are conservative. Um, it did not consider the full impacts of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, 
uh, nor did the agency consider how state standards would already provide a strong platform for growth for zero emission vehicles. Um, additionally, it includes a section re that reinforces states' rights to regulate emissions from locomotives and from rail, which EPA later will later later finalize in October. Um, and that this recognized that the prior way it looked at the law incorrectly prevented states from developing life-saving locomotive regulations. Uh, and the EPA has now reversed this view. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. Um, so for our demands, where right, we we feel again that this this rule. Um, the way it's currently written is not strong enough, um, and it actually did not address the critical demands that we we set forth as moving forward network members, uh, which was to ensure that there will be significant enough emission reductions within EJ communities from heavy duty trucks, as well as creating creating a clear pathway for zero emission vehicles. Uh, we know that zero emission trucks are available and commercially viable today, right? So there is no excuse for delaying progress towards zero emission in freight. We have the technology, we have the ability, uh, but what we need is the regulations from the EPA and the administration to make sure that these solutions are being implemented. Next slide, please. Well, Seth, this is such great information and you have such rich content that you're sharing here. Our interpreters have sent me a little message. He's reading too fast. So if you could just slow it down just a beat, that would be yeah, fantastic. Please. Sorry, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and of course, what we mean when we're talking about heavy duty trucks, right, is the the large semi trucks, the the big trailers that we see on the streets. They carry all of our cargo within uh, the containers. They carry them from uh, from from the rail ports to the intermodal rail yards to warehouses. Um, it's it's basically how our our goods are moved throughout the country, right? So that's a key thing to to remember too: is what is a heavy duty truck. Um, and and the EPA's role in in regulating them is is really why this rule is so important, right? They they should be regulating these these heavy duty trucks. Um. So so yeah, with that, I'll continue then on on our MFN demands. Um. Uh. So the second second major demand we have is is to ensure that there's a clear pathway to zero emission and the, and the sales mandate with a hundred a hundred percent zero emission trucks by twenty thirty five. Um, this also includes a scrapping program so that EJ communities are not further burdened by cumulative cumulative, cumulative impacts from the increased number of trucks, right? So this is really key to address environmental racism and injustice is that this final phase three GHG rule must guarantee emissions reductions from heavy duty trucks in EJ communities and guarantee that 100% that sales mandate, um, as well as avoiding false solutions um, so next, next slide, please. Um, and so the prioritization uh, of zero emissions for freight trucks, again, is a really key thing. Uh, so when we talk about the way that vehicles are classified, right, you have multiple classes uh, and class seven and eight are really important in, in what we're talking about, because this is, these are the, the heavy duty trucks that are considered drayage trucks. Um, they're, they're known as short haul trucks because they they mostly carry uh, freight between uh, uh, in short distances between the the rail yards and the inter, um, and the warehouses and the ports. Right. So they, these are not the long haul trucks that you see on highways going from state to state. These are all these these short haul trucks only stay within the region that they operate in. Um, and these have never been prioritized in any heavy duty truck regulations. Um, and and this is also very concerning because. These are some of the oldest and most polluting vehicles uh, that we have in our frontline and fence line communities, right? So for a place like Chicago, for example, this is really, really critical that we get this class seven and class eight drage trucks more heavily regulated. Uh, and so this is why we're urging the administration to really adopt a zero emissions agenda that aims to eliminate the toxic emissions and cumulative impacts in frontline communities. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, one of the most important ones is uh, the environmental justice and public health analysis. Currently, there is no analysis in the, the final rule um, or in the final draft rule, um, and we really need this to be part of it, right? This is, this is really critical that the EPA and the Biden administration, you know, act based on the urgency and the needs of our frontline and fence line communities and not take into account or not, not prioritize industry. 
Um, and this is why we're not backing down on our demanding of the EPA that they pass these strong standards that eliminate the threats that frontline communities experience from this toxic freight pollution, right? So they must uphold their commitments um, and, and their, their, their commitment to addressing environmental racism and injustice. Uh, and this is why this, this phase three GHG rule must guarantee emissions reductions from heavy duty trucks in our communities. And on next slide, our last demand um, is that the, the, the new rule includes a multi-pollutant standard that regulates not only GHG emissions, uh, but all the additional pollutants, for example, nitro nitrogen oxides, particulate matter. Um, these are the, the, the um, some of the most polluting, as was mentioned earlier, right? So we, this is really critical that we that we regulate these um, these uh, these additional pollutants, um, and we need again we need this rule, this program, um, this incentives that comes from the EPA to address environmental racism and and prioritize environmental justice, prioritize our communities, um, and the current draft rule does not meet any of our demands, any of the demands from from MFN's EJ leaders. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Dave to talk more about the the differences between the current draft and our demands. Thanks, Jose. If you go to the next slide. So, you know, we heard from Dr. Strobel about, you know, the long standing history um, that's led to a lot of the environmental injustice around freight. We heard from Atenas, clear, <laughs> current, urgent need to deal with it. And Jose, um, the demands that uh, the Moving Forward Network had in order to respond to this current and urgent problem. Um, so I thought I would walk through a little bit uh, how how the EPA's greenhouse gas proposal compares to those demands. So first and foremost, EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, did not set a zero emission vehicle mandate, nor did they require any reductions in um, nitrogen oxides or particulate matter. And so this speaks to exactly the concern that Jose raised on the last slide, which is that um, without a zero emission, without a requirement that the tailpipe emissions from these vehicles from at least a portion of the fleet is zero, there's no guarantee uh, of any additional uh, reductions in the harmful pollution that, you know, Atenas was talking about uh, harming uh, communities. Uh, additionally, EPA's proposal, when when one looks at the the targets in in their rule, um, EPA the rule only goes through 2032. Um, but even at that, if you sort of look at the trajectory that uh, that EPA's proposal would put the the freight industry, the the trucking industry on, EPA's proposal falls well short of uh, a 100% target uh, by 2035. So the idea that you know we would sell nothing but zero emission trucks by 2035, EPA's proposal comes nowhere close. And part of the reason for this is that they haven't considered all of the, um, frankly, all of the financial incentives that uh, have been written into law. So they haven't considered the full impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act or the I always have to look this up, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, which you may also know as the bipartisan infrastructure law. So recent uh, laws passed to um, accelerate incentive and incentivize zero emission trucks. Um, they also have not considered the full impacts of state standards. So California has both uh, an advanced clean trucks program and advanced clean fleets rule. And those are now being, uh, the advanced clean trucks rule is being adopted by states around the country. And that actually does put a sales requirement um, on, on the heavy duty in industry in those states. And an EPA hasn't fully considered how, um, how the impacts of those state rules are going to uh, affect the industry moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, importantly, um, you know, the advanced clean fleet, the advanced, advanced clean trucks and advanced clean fleet targets are achievable. Um, but if we look at 
how EPA's uh, targets for 2032 uh, compare to the advanced clean truck rule, we can see that uh, when it comes to vocational trucks like delivery vans and refuse trucks, um, the proposal falls short. And when it comes to the very important class eight trucks that Jose was uh, talked about, um, you can again see, you know, tw uh, EPA is targeting just 25% of new truck sales by 2032 compared to 40% uh, under the ACT. And this is, you know, this is a lower percentage than the vocational vehicles. And, you know, it really seems to indicate a de-emphasis on exactly the types of vehicles that are, you know, the, the drayage trucks that, that are running through communities. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, the proposal did also, also did not implement recommendations of EPA's science advisory board to develop a strategy for the systematic and quantitative evaluation of the environmental justice impacts of air pollution regulations. Throughout the rule, EPA talked a lot about and recognized that it, the potential that impact that this rule could have on communities, but actually did not look to ensure that it is driving exactly the reductions in uh, that that it needs to. Um, so, if we go to the next slide, please. So, I, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about actually how EPA developed its rule, and also then how um, this what the real impacts of this could likely be. So. This is, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm a science guy, uh, so you're stuck with a few charts, um, but uh, EPA currently has greenhouse gas tar rules for um, the heavy duty vehicle sector, but those rules were not based on any deployment of zero emission technology. And so uh, for their proposal, EPA said, well, we've got these rules, the phase two rules, they sort of say how far diesel powered trucks could get. Um, then we're gonna do an analysis. They did an economic analysis using uh, their uh, heavy duty trucks model, um, which looked at you know, how battery technology is going to evolve, how that will drive costs for industry down. And you know, basically industry, uh, according to their model will purchase whatever is economically feasible. So for example, their model says that class eight, that 27% of future truck buyers in 2032 that are looking to purchase a class eight tractor are just gonna, are gonna go electric um, because it's economical. So then they just averaged those things together. They said, well, 27% is gonna be zero emissions and uh, then that remaining 73% will be that phase two. So that's the this second bar. For vocational, they, they did the same analysis and said, well, for vo in the vocational space, you know, the, um, the routes are a lot shorter, but there's a lot more rapid uh, opportunity. So economically, you know, buyers are just gonna want to, you know, we think that this makes economic sense. And so their analysis actually didn't, from a regulatory perspective, even their own analysis isn't actually targeting pushing trucks forward. They're sort of saying, we think the, that the industry will, will want to go this way and we're just sort of uh, ensuring, setting a floor um, for, for what we think industry would already do. But if we go to the next slide, so um, the challenge is that the way compliance works for a manufacturer is not you know this nice simple picture that that epa has painted and this gets to one of the main demands that that um we that moving forward network has which is that we needed to guarantee a specific share you know we need to guarantee sales of these zero emission vehicles because the averaging approach that epa considers isn't sufficient for driving those vehicles. So um, under EPA, the all class eight sales for a manufacturer are lumped together. So whether they sell EVs or whether they, you know, whether they sell a tractor EV or a track diesel tractor or, uh, you know, diesel vocational vehicle, at the end of the day, they just have to meet some average standards. So that's what I'm showing here on the 
on the graph on the left is basically just a combination of the two simplified graphs that I had before. So this is, you know, EPA says, you know, we're going to, you know, out, brings those together and you get, and you get some average number uh, of credits. But from a, a manufacturer's perspective, uh, which is this graph on the right, uh, sorry, OEM stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. It's a term of art um, in our space. Um, you know, they are looking at compliance from the perspective of, well, so I, I already have in plan, plans in place to meet um, the phase two targets. California and other states are th under the advanced clean trucks rule are already making me sell EVs of, of both vocational and uh, heavy duty tractors. So that's a bit of compliance, those yellow and orange bars. Um, I like to sell engines. <laughs> um, there's a lot of funding for hydrogen infrastructure. I'm just gonna make uh, some engines that burn hydrogen instead of diesel fuel. And unfortunately in EPA's current proposal, because that fuel doesn't contain carbon, those count as having no tailpipe emissions or having uh, no greenhouse gas emissions, but they have plenty of tailpipe emissions that of the kind that can harm uh, communities. But so uh, if, I, if, if I'm a manufacturer and I sell 10% of my fleet uh, as 0% hydro, you know, uh, vehicles, so those are, those are combustion vehicles instead of EVs. Um, I can also just improve my diesel fleet beyond what was required under the current standards. So let's say I have another 10% um, improvement in fuel efficiency from the rest of the fleet, my diesel fleet. So now we're left with just this one little tiny bar of extra uh, ZEVs in states that don't already require um, uh, vehicle sales. So if we go to the next slide, just to put some numbers to this. So EPA was looking at this great rule from their perspective that said, in 2032, 32% of class eight vehicles are going to be uh, zero emissions. But when you actually break down to what could be required for, uh, you know, a manufacturer, um, they're actually only going to get an increase. They could get an increase of as low as like six percent, and in, in and and those are in you know the the eighty percent of the market that hasn't adopted um, the advanced clean trucks rule. And so that disparity um, and this and this challenge is is really important and why we need to ensure that the federal standards are, are as strong as possible. And to talk uh, more about the interaction between state and uh, federal rules, I'll hand it back over to Jose. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Uh, if we go back to, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so, so, you know, the reason why this is also important, right, is is because we need federal action on this. We, we can't continue to rely on what states are doing. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not um, enough, right? And, uh, and for example, in Illinois, where we have zero, regulations um, at the state level on freight, whether it's through trucks or rail. Um, and, and this is really causing a major problem for our communities. Um, you know, similar to what uh, Athena said earlier, right? We've also done some truck counting in in uh, Chicago and in, in the Chicago area. Um, and I mean, we're seeing intersections within the Little Village neighborhood that have as many as uh, 5,000, you know, medium and heavy duty vehicles passing through our, our intersection. Um, and there's, this is a, a similar story to many other parts of the city as well as many many other parts of the country, right? So this is really critical that we get this right. Um, there's a lot at stake for our communities. Um, you know, we're we're you know from LA to Chicago to New Jersey to the Southeast to many other parts of the country to Kansas City. Um, right, our communities are are in the shadow of freight. Um, there's thousands of of trucks coming through our communities daily, um, and millions, you know, all throughout the, the the span of the entire year. Right, they're spewing pollution. It contributes to asthma and heart disease, and shortens the lifespan of our children, of our families. And this is why our communities continue to fight for zero emissions freight. Right, they 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 live in we all of us we live in diesel death zones. Right, we see the direct correlation between the health disparities and those freight trucks. And frankly, we all have a right to to have 
clean, uh, clean air that we can breathe, that's free from toxic pollution, free from freight from freight pollution. Uh, and we what we what we don't want to see happen from the, the feds is, is false promises, um, you know, such as alternative fuels or or other uh, other you know um, rules that will allow for uh, alternative fuels to be used. Right, we need zero emission solutions. This is what's critical to us. Um, we we know that with these with these trucks constantly driving through our communities, that are uh, uh, we're the ones who are are on the front lines, and therefore our voices, our demands, and what our communities are asking for must be heard in this final rule from the EPA. Uh, it's, we've been fighting this fight for decades now, uh, from you know communities across the country, um, and it's time for the EPA and for the administration to act and to move to zero emissions and freight. Uh, we can't we can't continue relying on what states are doing although it's been uh it's been a great you know um um start and kind of uh supplementing what what's been happening at the federal level uh we need <clears throat> we need this to actually we need the fed the federal you know the EPA and and uh, the administration to actually lead on this issue we can our communities cannot continue paying the true cost the true cost of this freight pollution uh with our lives um so with that I'll pass it back to Dr. Strubel um, and we'll continue chatting about this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jose. I, I think what you said there at the end was really captures everything. Our communities can't continue, can't afford to continue to pay the true cost. Uh, with all these actions, with all this pollution, there's a cost. And there are certain communities that are paying the majority share. And that's our communities. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. Um, I want to bring your attention here to just back to I told you there's a call to action. We didn't just bring you here to dump all this information on you. There's really efforts that we want to go forward with, that we're taking as a network, all our grassroots organizations, all our academic partners, and all the bigger environmental organizations that are supporting us. And it's really about um, looking at the impacts from freight pollution, from freight trucks and the pollution on our communities, and we want it to be addressed immediately. The EPA and the Biden administration, we need a stronger regulatory framework that guarantees zero emissions. This also can't be the end of our work, but this is really a moment for us to align around working to eliminate pollution from freight, the freight transportation system and the capacity that it impacts and hinders the ability for our communities to thrive and for children to grow up without asthma, without certain cancers that are all preventable. So we want to ask you to join us by sharing this information on social media. You can scan um, this QR code right here, and it'll take you to a link. I mean, it'll take you to a web page that shows you multiple resources and ideas that you can utilize to help spread information about this important work and what's happening. And if we all work together, we could really start to move this forward. So with that said, that's going to wrap up the presentation component here, and we're going to transition into our Q&A. And I believe we probably have a, a lot of great questions. And we just want to have a discussion with everyone uh, and kind of uh, explain how we can uh, really move this forward to anything we may have missed. Thank you all so much. So I'm back. I've got some questions already in the Q&A. And I have a question that was asked and answered in the chat but we wanna make sure that our Spanish speakers are also able to hear both that question and answer. So I'm gonna recap it. Um, before I do that, please note questions that you have right now for our panelists and moderator, put them in the Q&A if that feels good and comfortable. Um, if you would rather speak it aloud, please go ahead and uh, use the raising your hand feature at the bottom of the menu bar as well. And I will unmute folks and call on you in just a minute. So our very first question is, um, would the environmental justice and public health analysis be a mandate for every state? Again, this was in the chat. Would the environmental justice and public health analysis be a mandate for every state? We have an answer from Molly Greenberg, um, staff at Moving Forward Network, and the answer is as such. In this case, the demand is that an environmental justice and public health analysis should be included in the rule in order to show that it must be stronger and must guarantee emission reductions in environmental justice communities. In this case, it is for a national or federal mandate, but this should be part of the state rules that are similar to the ones at the federal level. 
So that was the question and the answer previously. Next question that we have that has not been answered yet. So panelists and moderator, please uh, jump in, not all at the same time, please. This one is the zero emissions for heavy trucks is because they use electric batteries as opposed to diesel or gasoline. If so, are there concerns with where the materials for the batteries come from? I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding. Does anyone want to take that one on? Dr. Cook, you want that one? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think it's really important to, uh, as part of the Moving Forward Network's uh, zero emission freight strategy, um, when when the Moving Forward is, is talking about zero emissions, it is not just for at the tailpipe, but really looking at across the supply chain. We don't want to uh, shift the pollution burden from one community to another. And so it is important to think about um, things like sourcing of, uh, or of batteries and the pollution associated with that. It's also important to think about, so in, in this case, we are talking uh, ab about uh, electric trucks. It's also important to think about um, you know, where the electricity is that is being produced to, to drive those trucks and a lot. And so part of the, the zero emission uh, freight work is also about driving emissions from the energy, the power sector to zero as well, because we know that a lot of the same communities that are burdened by truck pollution are the same communities that are disproportionately burdened by, uh, you know, coal and gas power plants. And, and so, you know, we are driving the freight sector to zero, but that as part of that, we're also making sure that, you know, zero means zero, it's, it's zero for, you know, we're, we're reducing those impacts and not just shifting the burden from one community to another. Great answer. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question, if that's all right. Does that seem okay? Yes. Okay, here's the next one. Good evening. While I believe heavy duty freight pollution is a grave concern, you mentioned this is in the phase three or that there's a phase one and two. How do we gather air quality report information and use data to advocate for change locally, state, and on the federal level. Jose, you wanna take that one? Um, yeah, the the um um part of the part of the issue has also been access to air air monitoring. Um and we need so we need stronger, you know, air monitoring by the EPA. Uh, and that that includes, you know, of course, from the national level to the local level. Um but I'm not. I'm actually sure if there's been any reports done that's looked at air quality from phase one and two, um, or from for seeing how how this has been, um, uh, how the, I guess seeing the, what what kind of impacts this has already had. Uh, but we do know again that there's there's a major lack, major severe lack of of data when it comes to air monitoring, uh, which we've actually been pushing, um, at, at, you know, EPA from the from the the federal level to the state level. To our local public health agencies in Chicago, we're engaging in a, a pretty massive uh, air quality, or I'm sorry, air monitoring, uh, the building of an air monitoring network. Um, but that's been a key issue for us in, in terms of advocating is this, the lack of data, the, the fact that we're not able to always point to, hey, this is what exactly what the particulate matter levels are in our community on this day, because the data hasn't been available. But I'm not sure if anybody else has any updates in terms of, of what the actual, if there's been reports from from um from the EPA on phase one and two. I I I can tackle the phase one and phase two. Please, okay. Um so it's important here to distinguish so this is the phase three greenhouse gas rule. The phase one and phase two rule was also again focused solely on greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, there is information about how trucks, you know, new vehicle fleet sales and fleet fuel economy. But what 
those rules, what the phase one and phase two rules did not touch at all was the nitrogen oxide emissions and the particulate matter and the, the more commonly like direct health uh, impacts. Um, that is covered under an entirely separate rule. Um, and we did, uh, it was mentioned um, briefly in, in the presentation, there was a recent rule by EPA they set the first um, new uh, re uh, new rule for heavy duty engines that is designed to reduce uh, nitrogen oxide and particulate matter pollution. It's for, like for the first time, and it, it had been 20 years, over 20 years since they had last updated those rules. But part of the reason why they 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 updated them was that the data was showing that they weren't getting the air quality reductions that they thought and that trucks were polluting a lot more heavily than were in, anticipated under the rule. And so, um, and one of the shortcomings and why we're trying to use the phase three rule to, to drive additional reductions in, in nitrogen oxide and particulate matter and drive towards zero is that the rule that they adopted in 2022 um, I think is right, um, was targeted solely at combustion engines. So it doesn't, it didn't actually do anything to incentivize the adoption of electric trucks. Absolutely. Thank you. We have more okay. questions. Yes, we do. We have one more right now. Um, also just want to remind folks, if you have a question, Please use the Q&A feature. A few folks are putting things in the chat. That seems to be okay right now too. Or raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question directly. So here's a question that came from the chat. Um, here we go. How do we engage and protect the truck drivers who are often low income, and are often responsible for the cost of upgrading trucks? I think that is a great question. I'll take a, a initial crack at it and I'll let the panel chime in as well. I think it's, it's very important that we advocate that when we get policies coming from the, the federal government, that as we look to, it's called a just transition, right? That's what we're seeking ultimately. And as we move towards a just transition, there has to be funding and resources made available to help our low income truck drivers make that transition without incurring the additional cost of themselves. So you have to put out incentives. You have to incentivize transitions to make it more efficient and expedient or else it's not good. It's going to be all the pain still felt on specific communities that can't afford to do so. So a uh, just transition is ultimately what we're seeking. And we have to make sure we're advocating for that as we move forward. And uh, a tennis, I, I, we haven't heard from you. I don't know if you're still available. You want to chime in there? Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I just picking back up on what you also added is that the just transition is that we want to ensure that this is almost in a cascading effect, right? Because there's larger uh, companies and industry that utilize uh, these uh, heavy duty and medium duty vehicles that are worth billions of dollars, right? So we're not wanting to see that only the enforcement is happening and starting with small businesses. We want to see it cascade from the larger companies and make their way down. And then as to like what Bruce was saying also is that it's going to provide opportunities for financial incentives. Um, I'm also thinking about, I know this is a little bit away from this, but school buses, that's another uh, example of how we're seeing grants and funding coming down from the federal level to be able to transition school buses, especially in communities that are considered environmental justice, fence line, those are the priority communities and they can get kiddos on school buses that are zero emissions uh, versus those uh, diesel guzzling ones. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, no, thank you. I think this is a really, really important question. And like like Dr. Struble and Athena said, right, the just transition here is, is really key to what we're trying to do. Um, so I think the the other thing to keep in mind um is that, you know, when you talked about right, who's who's responsible for this, you know, part of the issue, the larger issue is is how the trucking industry has been deregulated, right? And that's another thing that we have to also be thinking about 
is how do we be holistic in this approach when we're advocating for this work or um or you know advocating for policy changes right the the way that truck drivers have been forced to 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 take on the burden of you know the maintenance the gas the you know the long hours you know the some economists have called uh have called um truck driving uh you know um uh was like slave labor on wheels basically i forgot exactly how it was it was essentially mm -hmm. that you know that that uh that concept right so um so yeah we have to be thinking about how we ultimately get better regulations and better protections for truck drivers as a whole um and i know here in the state of illinois right where, where we're pushing for the act and hdo we also are working to complement those policies with with some additional incentives like we mentioned right where we where we actually get some money to those truck drivers those independent operators you know, to 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 um to be able to purchase an electric truck when they are when they are ready to do so. Uh, but I think this is a really key thing too that we're thinking about. Excellent points. Okay, I don't have anything else in the Q and A, and I don't see any other questions in the chat. I do see a request to put in the chat the URL web address that this QR code is going to. So please know that we are working on that. Um, also reminder that all of the slides, the recording of our time together will all be sent to everyone who's here today um, and everyone who registered but wasn't able to join us um, today. We will have a follow-up email where all of these materials will be sent. Um, we also just put in the chat right now the URL um, without having to use the scan. Um, so please note that. Is there anyone who wants to raise their hand and say, their question aloud, or are there any other questions that folks want to put in the Q&A or the chat? And I'm going to give people a moment on that um, and see if there are any other pieces that any of our panelists or our moderator want to return to um, as we do that. Oh, wait, I have a question already. Um, so hold that thought, panelists. Here we go. Here's our question. Are you taking into consideration going to cleaner electric vehicles that the electric grids in local and statewide must be upgraded, that cost would be enormous. Um, I'm going to put that question in the chat. <laughs> it wouldn't be bigger than the defense budget. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, does anybody want to... I think... Um, let me say to that very quickly, and, and, and I said that jokingly, but ultimately, when we talk about cost... The cost is already enormous on the impacts that it's having on the lives of Black, Indigenous, and Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islanders, and poor whites throughout this country. And we're seeing people are being impacted. Their medical bills are, the cost there is enormous. So I don't want to uh, be dismissive of that concern that it is going to take an investment. But what we're looking at the research is showing that the investments are going to pay off in advancing the country, reducing the health care burden that people are experiencing, and requiring us to upgrade our infrastructure, which is just something that has to happen over time. Uh, regardless of the the cost. So I think we have to be smart about it, but we just have to make decisions about and, pri and prioritize the health of people in our communities. And I think ultimately when you look at that with the cost benefits analysis, that's how we're going to decide uh, where we need to put more, more funding and get that done. Um, so with that, I'm going to open that up to my, uh, to the other members on the panel and see if they have any thoughts on that question. Yeah. I, I mean, I can I can talk a little bit about the 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 direct the uh, direct question about the grid because um, I think one of the things that's really important to recognize is that this transition isn't happening overnight um, and you know for many of these communities unfortunately right but um, what we're talking about in terms of the infrastructure needs for you know EV charging and and the ability to support uh, charging of uh, of electric vehicles, electric heavy duty vehicles, is investment in uh, transmission and distribution um, that is ongoing. Like the level of investment that uh, utilities are already 
uh, putting forth to modernize the grid in many ways is very comparable to the same types of upgrades that you need to support uh, the electric vehicle uh, sector. Um, and you can also, uh, so at the, as we make this transition, you know, you can start at high and, and prioritize certain really heavily traffic corridors, for example, um, to, you know, and, and grow out from there. So whether you're, you're targeting around, uh, you know, high traffic ports where there's a, a, where you expect a lot of deployment or uh, high traffic you know, freight corridors, you can sort of with, you know, make, ensure that your investment is, is, you know, targeting some of the places that are most likely to deploy uh, electric trucks first and, and get the ball rolling and, you know, and fill in and build out from there. So we have in our, in, in our technical comments, a whole, <laughs> whole analysis around this this question it is definitely something we've thought about so um thanks thanks for the question thank you okay i'm going to go to our raised hand does that feel good dr struble yes please okay so carlos ramos we see you with your hand um up i'm going to unmute you and uh, please go ahead and ask your question Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Well, it's just a comment. I agree with Mr. Dr. Bruce. It's trouble. You know, there is a saying. It says something like, everything is too far for that one who does not want to go. Because, you know, everything is too much for that one who does not want to spend on that kind of money, on that purpose. And also, I noticed, you know, here we are trying to convince the people who take decisions, you know, for us to kind of convince them, to kind of support us. I think whoever can do it, you know, it's time, I think, to start going to, into those, taking those places, you know. We can be always with our community, but whenever we can, we need to start kind of, I would say, migrating to those companies, to those corporations, to the government, you know. So the more we are in there, the, the easier it's going to be, you know, to protect that community. That's all. That's only my comment. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent point. Okay. So our last question is, hello, everyone. What are other pressure points to get the federal government to implement a strong policy on heavy duty trucks? Great question. I'm gonna let my panel take this one, which I got for, for them. I was waiting to see if whoever else jumped in. Um, <laughs> you got it. This is a great. It's a great question. Um, I think there's there's definitely multiple ways. We do have some some allies in the the U.S. Uh, House and and in the Senate. Um, you know, we were in uh, uh, in D.C. and I think it was March, was it? And uh, um, and Senator um, Markey, right from from Massachusetts, is one of our big allies. Uh, but that's one way I think is calling your your local, you know, your local uh, uh, House representatives and and uh, senators, um, and advocating for them to also, you know, get on the EPA, um, and and really push them to to act, um, to create as, as stringent rules as possible. Um, so that's one is at least, you know, engaging with with them to, um, to see if if they can have any kind of influence in the process. Excellent. A tennis, you have anything on that? Doctor? Okay. Well, she if, might have dropped off again. Okay, then we can move to the, I hope that answers the question. Uh, then we can move to the last uh, two questions that we have in the chat, and then we can, okay. we can wrap. All right, here we go. Um, the next question is, over here in my state, New Jersey, a law was recently signed, and it's about making it a requirement for recycling of lithium-ion vehicle batteries by corporations. 
who specialize in the manufacturing of electric vehicles and charging infrastructure and any other type of tech. Is there an interest in implementing this in other states too? The recycling of lithium ion vehicle batteries, that is. Wow, that's interesting legislation. Dr. Cook, do you have anything on that or Jose? <laughs> Any, any thoughts there? Um, I, I can just admit that this is outside uh, of the, the, the area that I cover, but I do have a colleague, Jessica Dunn, who is working on exactly those types of policies. Um, and I know we are looking, she, she is working at both the, the federal and state level, but I'm, I'm not sure, honestly, um, and would have to follow up whether there are similar um, similar bills, but this is, that's exactly the type. It is, you know, I, I think it got to the, one of the first questions that we had about, about, you know, where we source battery materials, recycling is, is a really, you know, closing that circle is a, is a really important way of minimizing the burden on, on other, on communities. Excellent. Thank you. That's a really great question. I think that's something we want to share more information about, because that's really great or really interesting legislation, I should say. And I would like to learn more about it myself and see, you know, I don't know if it's there's an appetite for it down here in Florida, but I think it could be useful. So uh, let's see where that goes. But thank you for bringing that up, Talani. Uh, and we have another question, Felicia. No, I think that is it for now. So before I, I pass it to you, Dr. Struble, to just wrap us up, um, I just want to thank our interpreters uh, so we have Natasha and we have Aaron um, who have been doing our interpretation uh, tonight or this afternoon. I just really want to thank them. I want to thank Atenas who is not on the Zoom anymore um, and for coming back to even with that technical challenge. I want to thank the MFN staff who make all of this possible, Molly and Cecilia and the rest of the folks who are not necessarily hands in on this as well. And of course, our rest of our remaining panelists, um, Dave, Jose, and Dr. Bruce Strubel, thank you all so much for being here. I wanna remind you all that there will be an email follow-up with the materials that this QR code will lead you to. And there will also be the recording to this webinar and also the slides will be in a follow-up email to all of you here joining us and those who registered but could not. So back to you, Dr. Strubel just wrap us up um, and thank you so much again for your moderation. All right, thank you, Felicia. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to Molly Greenberg and Cecilia and all the people at MFN who made this possible for us and organized this for us all to be here. Uh, this is a really great, insightful event. I learned a lot. I hope you all learned a lot as well. And just remember, we're gonna be working on this. Our contact information is in the chat. You're gonna get an email. Uh, and there will be much follow up with actions to come because we're very serious about this and we are not backing down because we're fighting for the people we love. Thank you all and you all have a great night.